talk about our speaker a little bit today. Uh, just when you think you know somebody pretty good, you find out some minor details that you really didn't know about. Uh, the 750 folks that got ex uh, ex expelled from the Russian embassy about a month or so has nothing on our speaker today. Uh, he actually got exiled from Russia uh, by Vladimir Putin in 2000. I'm just trying to figure out whether this preacher at Radius Church and a member of our community work, really worked for the NSA, the CIA, <laughs> the Foreign Services, or the Secretary of State, but y'all kind of figured out it yourself. Uh, anyway, uh, I think the relationship that he had with Vladimir Putin allowed uh, the Trump campaign to really start talking about Russia and what they would do uh, as far as what, uh, how they would infiltrate our election. Uh, process, but i uh, tell you a little bit on a serious note about our speaker today. Uh, Todd Carnes grew up in a small mill town in Alabama City, Alabama. He graduated from Alabama in 1992, and I think he'll tell you he's learning a little bit of humility uh, this year as being an Alabama uh, Crimson Tide versus a Crimson Tide. After graduation, he learned a lot about culture when he lived and worked in Russia for three years. Though he was exiled from the country in June of 2000, see, I went with them a story, by the newly elected president, a little known former KGB agent named Vladimir Putin. Now he likes to spend his time building things from churches to businesses to schools. Todd is the father of three daughters and has been married for 23 years to his wife, Terry, who is a teacher and volleyball coach in our community. Todd holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the University of Alabama and a master's degree in biblical languages from Southeastern Seminary of Lake Forest, North Carolina. He is the former lead pastor at Radius Church, current town council member in Lexington, and the general manager at Southern Ned Pediatrics, a small business based in Lexington. You can always tell that Todd's could be here. We always have a capacity crowd, and once again, People are here to hear what Todd's got to share with us. So, Todd, please join us up at the podium. We look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Comrades, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, true story. True story. I was in Russia in uh, 2000. Putin got elected, and everybody was like, they just wanted a strong, good, strong leader to put everything back in order which is what Russia's been doing for 2,000 years, and uh, good, strong leaders. Uh, sometimes they put things in order, they just never leave. So, I'm gonna start today, uh, I'm just gonna start with your strongest point. I'm gonna start with the strongest thing I got, I think. Maybe I am. There we go. With my family right there. It's my wife and, uh, and three daughters. I quit putting myself in those pictures because I look really old. I, uh, we, we cut that out last time I showed that, and everybody's like, I thought you had three daughters, not four. And I said, yeah, <laughs> I get it. So that's, uh, that's my family right there, Carrie and my three daughters. And last year, about this time, uh, I took them to the beach, as I often do. And we go to the beach, and they go work on their tan. And this was a town conference uh, scenario, so I was indoors where I like to be. And they were outdoors getting nice and golden brown. And so we... We had this great week at the beach, and we got back. My oldest daughter, she was off at school. My two youngest came home, and after one week at Isle of Palms of doing nothing other than exactly what they wanted to do, they met some new friends, got some new relationships with uh, some of the other people. They're sitting around my house on Sunday night, and they're thinking, what are we going to do on Tuesday? Well, they kind of go down the list, and they're trying to think of something that's not boring, that's fun, that's cool. I'm sitting there, you know, about to explode, and I'm like, well, you could go to Tommy's house. He's got a dock. I'm sure he lets you lay out. You can swim on the lake. No, I don't want to do that. Well, you know, we got a pool right here in the neighborhood. You could go up there. You could call some friends in. You could do something over there. No, I don't want to do that. And so we went down the list, and, like, nothing works. And finally... At the end of the day, they're texting, snapping, they're communicating with basically the whole world on their iPhone and my couch. Nobody can find anything to do, and so they finally decide on Tuesday. On Tuesday, after being at Isle Palms all week, they're going to Carowinds. Now, they haven't done the calculus on that, and they have no money. I'm an engineer. I do that calculus really fast. I'm like, that's $100 a head, and y'all got no money, and I'm not paying for that. 
I will figure it out. Now, I'm not paying for that. <laughs> and that night, I made a decree in my house. That was last year. I was talking about my 14 and 16 year old. I made a decree that night. Next summer, if your name is Carnes and you eat out of that refrigerator, you go to work. Everybody's getting a job. Because once you have spent a week at the beach and you're home for 24 hours and you can't think of anything that might possibly release one joy endorphin in your brain other than a hundred dollar trip to Carowinds, you're out of whack. <laughs> like I'm not helping you. I'm hurting you at that point. Because recreation, when it becomes central in life, it's sawdust in the mouth. And my pastor here, my good friend who's at Radius now, John Reeves, has an expression. He's got six kids. He says, some things just have to be discovered. And at that point, I realized my kids need to discover that just going and laying on the dock and swimming on the lake, <clears throat> it's beautiful after you worked hard for five days. <laughs> it's all you want. So this summer, it came to pass. My 14-year-old started yelling, I'm too young, I'm too young. I'm like, I'm on council, I'll get an exemption. <laughs> and I, do. I hate to use political favors, but sometimes it's necessary. <laughs> everybody went to work, and I guarantee you on Saturdays this year, when everybody's free, they just want to sleep in. I haven't heard anything about Carowinds. Because <laughs> they discovered something that I couldn't teach them. That can't be taught. You just have to learn that through experience. And, and I'm proud to say they've learned that through experience. Wisdom is this thing in life that you have to learn through experience. Can't be taught, it's rarely absorbed, but it's something that you learn through experience. Einstein said wisdom is not the product of schooling, but of the lifelong attempt to acquire. So I want us to pause for a minute today and let's talk about wisdom. Let's talk about the pursuit of wisdom. Let's talk about discovering wisdom. Let's talk about what it looks like when you lack wisdom, plenty of examples of that. One standing right up here behind the podium. As we think about wisdom, wisdom is this, is this thing that often gets saluted and gets a lot of lip service. And it's very important, but let's face it, it's not urgent. And things that are important but not urgent usually get kicked to the back burner. What's urgent? Success is urgent. And we're all here because we want to be successful. And by the way, you should never be apologetic about wanting to be successful. There's nothing either holy or humble about seeking failure. We're all seeking success. There's nothing wrong with that. We should run hard after success. But oftentimes, success is very urgent. And wisdom is very important. And so success gets way out ahead of wisdom. Because it's just not urgent. I mean, success, you got to make the payroll, right? The bills come, the rents due, the sales have to be made, the evaluations are there. You just don't have those kinds of tests with wisdom. And that's the reason why it easily gets kicked backwards. But when it does, what happens in life is your success far outruns your wisdom. And when that happens, you are set for exposure. And we could run down the list of names. We won't. But we could. I think uh, just recently, uh, not to throw stones, you get a guy like Scaramucci, who goes in as the director of communications at the White House. He sells $50 million worth of stock in a company he's got just to take the position. Hard decisions. <laughs> the guy's obviously got great leadership. He's obviously got high capacity. He's obviously very, very successful. But in the scrutiny of the moment, at some point in life, the urgent overtook the important and the wisdom didn't catch up. And when you're in that position, you're ripe for exposure. And so if you're young in your career, it, it, wherever you're at in your career, a guy told me early on, Todd, don't you ever take a position that's larger than your character or else you're set up for failure. Just a matter of time. And it happens to all of us. We're all subject to it because we're in this hard driven drive to be successful I call it the burden of success anybody here feel the burden of success I feel that burden I got a family I'm trying to take care of I got a future that I'm looking towards and you feel that burden of success I heard a story the other day this lady the Stanford psychologist is studying the older generations and finding out they're actually happier 
than the younger, which is not what we thought. We thought that, that old age was difficult and there are some difficult things, she said, but, but they're happier because they've been released from the burden of the future. But when you're young and in the middle part of your career, you feel the weight of the burden of success, the burden of the future, to define it, to go get it. And when you're running hard after that thing, it's easy to lose the burden of wisdom. But at the end of the day, your legacy will be defined by your wisdom, not by your success. Because here's what I find after doing lots and lots of funerals after 20 years of ministry, is that the outward circle of your life, all those people on the outside, they're going to look at your success. But your inward circle, they're going to look at your wisdom. They're not going to talk about your balance sheets. They're not going to talk about your P&Ls. They're going to fight over all the stuff you leave. <laughs> But that inner circle, when you stand right there, as I did with my father 60 days ago, and you hold his hand as he breathes his last, which is beautiful. It's a beautiful thing to be there in that moment. All you think about is the wisdom. The wisdom that travels generation to generation. Oh, there's, there's wealth that travels generation to generation. There are businesses that travel generation to generation. I hope I get to be a part of that. I hope I can pass something off to my children. But I hope when they hold my hand and I breathe my last, that the, the topic of conversation at the time is my wisdom. I don't know. It's yet to be seen. I hope I fulfill that. I hope you do as well. So how do you do it? How do you live under the burden of success and the burden of wisdom? How do you pursue success vigilantly and not let wisdom fall behind lest you wind up in this place of, of really bad exposure? Let me give you a few ideas and let me preface this by saying I am not wise enough to say these things. I don't have either the correct answers or the best answers. But I did go to my 30 year reunion this past weekend so I'm old enough to at least have a few thoughts, alright? <laughs> let me give you a few thoughts you take to good, throw away to bad. Number one enemy of wisdom in your life and in mine is not success but it's success's first cousin. It's that little cousin that's always running around on the coattails, and it's called arrogance. Success and arrogance go hand in hand. Because once you're successful, you're the biggest voice in the room, and everybody wants to hear from you, and your words are most important, and everybody defers to you, and pretty soon, you just get in that mode, and you begin to believe that, and arrogance is right on the heels. And so the number one way that you pursue wisdom in all your career is you have to fight arrogance. I don't care who you are, it's in all of us. You have to battle with it, because here's arrogance's problem. Arrogance is always a teacher and never a learner. Always a teacher and never a learner. So just peel your ears back and get ready to fight arrogance because you're either arrogant or fighting arrogance all your life. Or you're an alien. I'm not sure. <laughs> Talk to a lot of people. That's been my experience. Number two, you've got to stay in a posture of humility. Humility is not common, but arrogance repels wisdom like the two positive sides of the magnet. Humility attracts it. And so you have to put yourself in a posture of humility. And that posture of humility is that posture of learning. But our culture, let's just face it, our culture is in love with arrogant leaders. I don't care if it's in the political realm or the faith realm or the business realm. You, you just pick a realm and we fall in love. We, we call it self-confidence, but I think we're just playing names. I think we're playing name games. A lot of times it's just arrogance. And, and, and as a culture falls in love with that, we have this idea of humility that somehow it's weak, it's indecisive, it's passive, it's none of that. If you've ever been around a strong, humble leader in life, it's the most beautiful thing in the world. There's no weakness there. It's just a guy that everybody wants to defer to or a lady that everybody wants to defer to and he wants to defer to everybody else because he realizes he or she has a really big voice in the room, but he realizes the other voices are probably just as valid as his on any given area. And so he or she humbly accepts the input of others. Humility. Humility is not weak. It's not passive. It's just a really good listener. And in a culture that is in love 
with the overconfident, I would say arrogant leader, boy, we need some humble leadership. I think we're, we're a lot more comfortable with comfortable lies than hard truths. And, and I don't think that's unique to us. I think that's unique to homo sapiens. That's unique to our race. Of all times, all people. But it's something like arrogance we have to fight against. What's the other thing you can do? It is you can put yourself in the company of really wise people. There was an old, old man, a king, a guy who led a nation. His name was Solomon, and he said this. He said, walk with the wise, and you will grow wise. But he who keeps the company of fools will suffer harm. And he was well intentioned when he said that because he did both of those things. <laughs> you read about his life, he had the highest of highs and the lowest of lows, and he wrote a lot about it. And as he did both of those things, there was a time when he walked with the wise, and he was incredibly wise, and people came from all over to hear him. And there was another time when he walked with the fools, and he became a blubbering idiot, destroyed everything he built. But then he, he came back enough to write about it. And so... As we pursue success, and I do this, and you guys do this, I mean, this whole thing is built on networking. We want to network. We want to find people that are more successful than us. We want to find people who can teach us, mentor us, pull us up. I want that. You want that. I didn't necessarily want that when I was 25 and knew everything. Now I desperately want it. But don't just pursue those people that are exceptionally successful. You make sure you pursue some people that are exceptionally wise. And realize this, that in our culture, in a culture that is enamored with, with what I call kind of an over self confidence and overindulgence, we're in a culture that is starved for wisdom. And so in our culture that has been said about our culture, that we love the sizzle and not the steak, that we don't really understand depth. In our culture, some of the really wise people in our culture, they don't ever get the mic. They don't ever get the platform. They don't ever get the big voice. They're a little more hidden. They're a little more subtle because, hey, they're, they're not enamored with the applause of the people. And B, they, a lot of times they, they just look a little different. But the, the discovery of life and things that have happened to them have made them exceedingly wise. And me and you and everybody else, we need some of these people in our life. They're our protectors. They, they are the people who keep you from exposure. I would go further to say that, that if you're in a place where nobody has corrected you in the last 12 months, you probably don't have any of these people in your life. Get some of these people in your life. We're good about finding successful people and tracking them down. Find wise people. They're a little hard to find, but they are the most important thing you can find. So as we think about wisdom, I want to, uh, I want to read this thing from Chief Justice John Roberts. He, he did a commencement speech a while back. I guess, I think his son was in this class, and there's this elite uh, school, like a middle school for boys, 6th to ninth grade, something like that, one of these boarding schools, and he sent his son there, and he did this commencement speech, and it was beautiful. And so it's a, it's a little wordy, but it's worth the read because he's trying to talk to these young men <laughs> at 8th and ninth grade. Good luck with that. You've know, you got to experience some things. But he was planting seeds of wisdom. I didn't even know half these words when I was in 8th and ninth grade. Listen, Justice Robert said this. Now, commencement speakers will typically also wish you good luck and extend good wishes to you. I will not do that, and I'll tell you why. From time to time in the years to come, I hope you will be treated unfairly so that you will come to know the value of justice. I hope you will suffer betrayal because that will teach you the importance of loyalty. Sorry to say, but I hope you'll be lonely from time to time so that you don't take friends for granted. I wish you bad luck again from time to time so that you'll be conscious of the role of chance in life and understand that your success is not completely deserved and that the failure of others is not completely deserved either. And when you lose, as you will from time to time, I hope every now and then your opponent will gloat 
over you. I feel you, Chief Justice Roberts, as an Alabama fan. <laughs> I hope your opponent will gloat over you, gloat over your failure. It's a way for you to understand the importance of sportsmanship. I hope you'll be ignored so you know the importance of listening to others, and I hope you will have just enough pain to learn compassion. Whether I wish these things or not, they're going to happen, and whether you benefit from them or not will depend upon your ability to see the message in your misfortunes. Whether you benefit from them or not will depend on whether or not you have maintained a posture of humility. Because if you're not in the right posture, these things can't be absorbed. They will not be learned. They will bounce off. Another story about one of my other daughters. I was riding with her not long ago. She's 20. We, we took a, a weekend trip. Went up to Slippery Rock, I think. I was bored. So I loaded them up. It's like, let's just go slide the rock. Let's do something. So we went up. We slid the rock and carried my, one of my other daughters. They were traveling volleyball somewhere. And so we're, we're coming home. And we're coming back from that Asheville, and we're on that winding downhill road, and it starts to rain. And when's the road the slickest? When it first starts to rain. And, and so we've, we've hiked, we've done slippery road, we've done all this. I'm the old man, I climb in the back, I'm trying to get a nap, and my two daughters are up front, and my 20 year old's driving. And the more I try to sleep, the closer she gets to the car in front of her. And she is all over it. But she's 20. She's been driving for four years. She's never had a wreck. So I keep trying to close my eyes and go to sleep. I keep looking up and see these cars and thinking about Baker collision or how, how soon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to get any help. because not, not only is she buying on this car, she's driving her mother's new car. And finally, at the end, I'm just in the back and I'm going, I hope when she wrecks, I hope it's her car and not her mother's. <laughs> so did I jump up? They go, land. You ever heard of the two-second rule? <laughs> Do you know anything about following distance? Do you know anything about stopping distance? I could jump in my civil engineer mode and, and drive all that, and I thought about it. I never thought this day would come, but believe it or not, I'm wise enough just to shut my eyes tight and lean back and go, I hope it's your car, not your mother's. <laughs> Why? Because she's never been sideways on the road. She's never seen a whole front of an interstate turn red and you jump on the brakes and wind up either in the ditch in somebody's trunk or fishtailing that thing all the way down. I've done that more times than I can count and so I'm nervous in the back. She's not nervous at all because she hasn't experienced that. And instead of just leaning into her and giving her this big long lecture while she rolls her eyes at me and says, won't you lean back there and go to sleep? I just let it go. Because I, I, I'm not sure that she's going to learn it until she has to stomp on those brakes and starts fishtailing and it's like, oh yeah, <laughs> I just discovered that. Now that's a very small thing, but it, it proves the point that wisdom will only land in the right soil if you have the right soil. And sometimes you just have to have some experience or else if people are throwing seeds at you, they just bounce off and go burn up. So the question is not, is wisdom calling out and sending you the information. The question is, is are you and am I in the posture of humility to let it take root? It's a hard thing to get there. It's a hard thing to stay there. But here's the other side of the coin. Success without wisdom is a dangerous force. It's a roadside bomb in your neighborhood. It's an IED at your office. It's a hand grenade in your living room. If you manage to reach success without pulling wisdom along, always ends poorly. So let me leave you guys with a few wishes. In a culture that's starved for wisdom, that, that loves comfortable lies and struggles with hard truths, I want to wish you and I want to wish myself some blessings in disguise. I want to wish to all of us just enough poverty to allow us to enjoy riches without being consumed by it. I want to wish to you and to I just enough failure to allow us to embrace humility when success comes. I want to wish for you and I just enough anxiety in our pursuit of success to provide us with continual compassion for those hustling just below the threshold of success. 
I want to wish for you and I just enough time laboring under the sizzle of poor leadership to allow us to value the honest truths of a wise leader. So as leaders in our community, as leaders in your faith community, as leaders in the area of commerce, politics, government, every arena, as we lead around here, let's put ourselves up under the burden of wisdom like we put ourselves up under the burden of success. We gotta pull those things simultaneously, and if we do, not only will we prosper, but our families will prosper, our community will prosper, our state will prosper, perhaps even our nation will prosper. But if you look through the chronicles of history, very, very few people have done this. But let's not worry about that because we get to write our own history. Let's bear the burden of wisdom. God has given us success. We live in this great, beautiful, prosperous community. We didn't pull this thing out of the ground. There were people before us that pulled this thing out of the ground and they put it on a tee and they handed it to us. And now we live in this place where everybody wants to come and for good reason and where we want to stay and for good reason. But we were given this. And so we can enjoy the success that has been provided by the generations before. Let's make sure that we hand off the wisdom that should be earned and discovered by us as leaders. Thank you.